So I want to tell you about the guy. Is he and his friend, and they were out playing golf one day, and uh, one of the guys was was on the green. He's lining up to to putt, and uh, as he was about to make his putting stroke, he noticed a long funeral procession that was going by on the road nearby him. And so, right in the middle of his backswing, he decides to step away, and he gets down on his knees. He takes off his golf cap. He looks towards the funeral procession, and he begins to say a, a prayer. And his buddy is really touched by what's going on, and, and, and he looks at him and says, wow, you know, that is the most thoughtful and touching thing I have seen in such a long time. He said, I can't believe that you were able to stop in the middle of your backswing and give up anything you're doing in the moment to be able to, to say this prayer. And the man said, yeah, well, we were married for 25 years, so I figured it's the least I could do. <laughs> You'll get it on the way home. <laughs> John chapter 15. Uh, John 15 is a really powerful passage. Go ahead and turn there, John chapter 15. It's a powerful passage because uh, this is the very words of Jesus uh, to his disciples before the garden. This is like the last thing that he gets to speak to them about. Some powerful stuff being shared. And in the midst of this, look at John 15 and verse 9. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And so in other words, he says, My love for you is the same of that of God's love for me. He says, Now remain in my love. Verse 10. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I obey the Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. And then if that's not enough, he goes on to define exactly what kind of love he has for us, he says, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And then he says, and you're my friends, if you do what I command. So we're commanded to love others in the same way that God loves us. And that's, that's the part right there that makes this command so intense, right? It makes this so extreme because it's not just love other people, but it's love other people in the same way that I loved you. And, and it's not a suggestion. It's not an ideal that you should strive for. It is a command that you are given. And I'll go a step farther to say all this is is simply a choice. Love is a choice. It, it's, it's a choice you, you have to choose to make in every moment. You've heard this before. This is nothing new. But I believe it so strongly. And, and so growing in your love doesn't mean you're growing in your emotions. It doesn't mean you're growing in your feelings. It just means you're growing in your choice. I mean, it really is as simple as choosing to be committed. And so when Jesus says, when God says, I love you, and I want you to love others in the same way that I loved you, and you look at his love for us, his love for us was just a choice to choose to love us even when we let him down. You remember at the beginning, right? And you have Noah and God sends this great flood because all of the people, he says, were so evil. He says, I, I'm going to send a flood to wipe them out. And then he gives this rainbow and he promises that I'll never do that again. Right? In other words, he says, I promise to love you and stand by you and to be with you no matter what you do. It was simply a choice. It was a declaration. It was, it was a decision. And that's what love is. It's a decision. It's a promise. It's a declaration. It's a vow to say, I am with you no matter what. 
And so that's why this is such an important lesson, because this is one of his greatest commands. And uh, le let me show you why this is so important. Um, he says this scripture in John, Jesus says, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. If you have what? Love one for another, right? And so in other words, let, let, me, let me show you what I'm talking about. Most people have a birthmark that is specific to them, right? Uh, designers, they have these trademarks that are specific. Companies have logos. How about that one? Companies have logos that you can identify them. If, if I were to put a bunch of logos up on the screen, you would know who they were, not because you're reading the title of the company or the name of the company, but because you see a logo and you say, I know that company, right? Well, God has established a mark for us, a, a logo for the Christian, right? A clear mark by which his children are going to be known. And he tells you, love is your logo, Love is the, the, the logo for the Christian. It's the identifying mark that when people see this mark in you, they'll say, there's a Christian. It's not by checking a box. It's not by proclaiming I'm a Christian. It's not, you know, going and, and no, 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 no. How will they know? By your love. And not just any kind of love, not love like the world loves. And, and of course, I could get all into it, you know. Uh, they bring me my favorite plate of fajitas at the Mexican restaurant. And I'm like, oh, I love fajitas. Mmm, <laughs> you know. But there's something different about God's love versus my love for fajitas, right? You know, and then you've got the three different Greek words for love, you know, you've got phileo, and then you've got agape, and you've got all these, you've got eros, you have all these different kinds of love. We could get all into this. There's so many sermons that have been preached on this, but here's what we have to understand today, and this is why preachers and myself, we keep coming back to this subject, is because God keeps coming back to this subject, and love, if we don't have it, we're nothing, right? First Corinthians 13, without love, you're just a, a clanging symbol. You're a noisy gong. This is the mark of the Christian. So you can, in other words, listen to me, you can get everything else right in Scripture. And if you miss this lesson, you're nothing. That's pretty powerful. That's why this is so important. You know, without love, it's like driving without your driver's license. You know, it's like flying to another country without your passport, right? Because love is your identification. It's your ID badge as a Christian. And so this is the most important thing. So let's talk for just a second about the kind of love that God says. Because again, he didn't say just love other people, but he defined it, love other people like I loved you. So how does God love us? Let's talk about it for just a minute this morning. Number one. God's love, and I, I, by the way, I intentionally did this. I started with the most difficult one for us to understand. This is the one that we wrestle with. So let's just get it out of the way early. You ready? God's love, number one, is tough love. Isn't it? A lot of times. And, and, and this is the characteristic of God's love that's most often misunderstood. And when I misunderstand the tough love of God, when I misunderstand that God disciplines, when I misunderstand this concept, then it's really easy for me to get angry at God when things don't go my way. It's really easy for me to turn my back on him because I justify what's going on by saying, if God were such a loving God, then why would he let this happen to me? How many people do you know that lost their faith over the answer to that question? So this is, this is the most important thing for us to understand because this is the thing that keeps people from believing in him. But there's so many passages that talk about the tough love of God. God did not hide this aspect of his love from us. Read the scriptures from Old Testament to New. God shows tough love a lot of time. Did you ever show your kids some tough love every now and then? Right? Does, does it mean you don't love them? No, 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 no. I show you that kind of love because I love you. But they don't always understand that in the moment, do they? And yet we don't either. 
Hebrews 11 and verse 6 is my favorite because it's so simple. Listen. He says, the Lord disciplines those he loves. Like he just straight tells you, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to discipline you because I love you. So the Lord disciplines those he loves. And so this simple verse lets you know something about love. And, and, and this is something that is becoming more and more misunderstood today. Listen to me. Love does not mean tolerance. It doesn't mean tolerance. Teenagers, you need to listen to me especially because your generation is suffering from this. But every generation is suffering from it right now. Our world's confused because they're redefining, listen, they're redefining love. That's not your place. God defined love. And he did it with one act on a cross. And that's his definition of love. And he says, by the way, God is love. God gave you the definition of what that is. So stop listening to what everybody else says because it is the most confusing thing when you start getting out in the world and people start to say, if you love me, then you'll agree with me. If you love me, then you won't challenge my beliefs because truth is relative and I get to choose what's true for me. I get to choose my gender. I'm, I'm so sick of this argument. I love you no matter what you believe. But because I love you does not mean I have to tolerate the sin in your life. I, in fact, the most unloving thing that I can do is let you live lost and never tell you that you're lost. Especially when I know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so if I want to show you where you need to live, then I need to, to take your life and hold it through the filter of God's word and let you know what he says about your situation, about your journey, and about your stance. And sometimes that means I'm going to have to say something that you don't want to hear. And that's okay. Our world hates this message. Because now Nathan just made himself arrogant. But what they don't understand is it's not me choosing how I want you to live your life. It's the Lord telling you how the way of your life is supposed to be lived. And I'm just supporting what he already said. Right? And that's what separates this to where it's okay for you to hear is because I'm not setting myself up on a pedestal to say, I know the way. No, no, no. I know the one who defined the way. I know the one who paved the road. And where he leads, I will follow. And I'll tell you where to go too. But our world, the, 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 the worst thing, listen to me, and you hear this all the time, this, this, this horrible phrase. It's, it's turned into a terrible phrase, and I'm tired of it. Can you tell I've had a gut fool this morning? <laughs> don't judge me it started off okay I didn't mind it at first because I'm like yeah no I'm not supposed to be judgmental I get that and, and then there was this whole church hurt movement you know you, you hear about that and people are like well church hurt me well, and I'm like, no, 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 that's okay, because some people, they did. Legalism just drives people away, and I'm all for that, because our God's not legalistic. He is a God of grace, right? But he's also a God of grace and truth, and so I can't just lean to one side and not the other. Our God is a God of balance, and he's a God of order, but we started preaching around to everybody. You hear it so much, it's become everybody's story. Church hurt. The church hurt me. It, it, right? It's almost this idea that church was a perfect place, and I was shocked that there was some sinners up in the church. Are you kidding me? This is the hospital for the broken. That's what church has always been. Jesus didn't come to call the, 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 the healthy to himself. He came to call the sick to himself. When did you expect anything different? And so when you walked in the door thinking you would never get hurt by the people in this room, sorry, the church would be perfect if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> in fact, we use this scripture, don't judge me, don't judge me, tolerate me. Truth is relative. I get to decide my own life. I can choose whatever I want. I can do whatever I want, and you should just accept that if you love me. And that's the most sick 
sick argument. Does that work for you and your kids? I hope not. I mean, I guess some people parent that way. Do whatever you want. I want cake. We'll get more of it. Have a second helping. Forget the broccoli. Go play in the street if you want to. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. We don't parent that way, but we expect others to treat us that way. And then we use scripture and we twist it. Here, here's what we do. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Jesus says, be careful when you judge somebody else because while you're looking at the speck in their eye, you got a plank in yours. Therefore, don't judge. Wait a second. Is that what that scripture said? It says, be careful when you do. It says, start with yourself. It's no good for me to, to come to you and say, hey, you're lost when I don't know the way. That doesn't help anything. So he says, when you're judging somebody else, you, you got to wait. Jesus had a sense of humor. He imagined a dude with a plank sticking out of his eye over there examining the guy that's got a speck in his. It's comical. And he says, so when you judge, start with yourself. Understand that you're not perfect. Understand that you're one of the people that makes the church imperfect. Understand that you're one of the people that Jesus had to come and save because your life was on a track that was going to get you straight into hell without the blood of Christ to come in to save you. So stop blaming the hypocrites in the church for the fact that you're going to leave. You've known that your whole life. And, and by the way, I beg you to come back and to renew again. If you left church because somebody in the church hurt you, I, number one, I'm sorry. But number two, you put your faith in the people and not in the Lord. I don't come because you're a Christian. It's not why I'm here. I don't come just because you love the Lord. I, become, I come because I need the Lord. I come because I want to praise the Lord who set me free when I didn't deserve it. How about you? You there with me this morning? Our world needs to understand this because it's confusing a lot of people. Let me move on. <clears throat> Let me say this. I told you I'd move on. Hang on. One more thing. So, so we believe that that scripture, because see, I didn't, I didn't land the plane there. We believe that scripture means don't judge. In fact, what that scripture is telling you is judge, just do it carefully. That scripture is a command to judge. And by the way, it's not the only one in case you're like, are you sure, Nathan? Here, go, you go and you need to read your scripture a little bit more and look on what God says about holding your brothers and sisters accountable, about snatching them from the fire in Jude, Right? Snatch others from the fire. How about restore such a one? How? Gently. <laughs> do it gently, but do it. Right? Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. How can I do that unless I make a judgment of what's right and what's wrong? Christ is all about you judging. You better start judging. And our world needs to do a little bit more. Christians need to stand up and start calling right, right, and wrong, wrong, even in the face of, well, if you tell me I'm wrong, then you don't love me. Well, then you're just going to have to believe the lie of Satan that I don't love you because this comes from the heart of wanting to help guide you. And I pray that we can have a mutual agreement in that so that when I go astray, I've got someone in my life who can say, Nathan, you got to get your life back in order too. That's how this thing works. We help each other and we hold each other and we carry each other to the feet of Jesus when we can't walk. That's what we do. This is a team. We are a family, more than a team. We're a family. And sometimes family has to have tough love. And by the way, let me share something with you. When you stand up that boldly, most times, not all the time, because everybody's different, more times than not, people will begin to respect you and follow you and love you more than before when you're willing to have that kind of conversation with somebody. Sometimes the people I'm closest to are the ones I've had the greatest conflicts with. But through the tough love, we've grown on a whole nother level. Right? I learned this whenever I was in youth ministry. When I first started in youth ministry, I wanted all the kids to like me, right? It, so it was a selfish thing, number one. But number two, I mean, come on, you want the kids to like you, but it, I also wanted them to like the youth group and the environment and to have a lot of fun. So when I would be teaching and a kid's just chit-chatting with everybody and causing an absolute mayhem, right? My response would be a very general, shh. 
how's that work for your kids? <laughs> right? So after about a year of just letting these kids just control the class, I finally said, I can't let this happen anymore. This is not working. And the ones who actually want to grow are being distracted from the ones who want to be the, the, the distraction here. And so I've got I've to give some discipline. And, and sometimes I went a little too far. All right, so I got to ask for a little bit of forgiveness. But discipline came, my friends. It was one youth minister against, I, I don't know, 60, 70 kids on any given night. And this youth minister won. <laughs> and if my kids are watching, you better believe it, right? But no, no, no. The thing was, is in, in reality, I did. I would call them out. I didn't want to embarrass them. I didn't want to humiliate them. But at the same time, I wanted them to know this wouldn't happen. So sometimes it'd start with a general thing. And then number two would be like, Regan, I need you to shut your mouth right now. By the way, she was not talking. Yeah, and we have a great relationship. I can pick on it. Regan, I need you to shut your mouth right now. You're, you're making everybody else around you uncomfortable and distracted. And we're trying to, and I'd start calling people out. And I was worried that those kids would never come back. You know what happened? My relationship with those kids exploded in a good way. They started finding me before class. They'd come up to me after class. When they had something exciting they wanted to share, they'd come and they'd bring it to me. And when they had something terrible go on, they'd say, Nathan, can I talk to you for a moment? I'd be like, absolutely. And all of a sudden, my relationship with those kids grew even after my discipline increased. In fact, my relationship grew exponentially with them once my discipline increased. What I learned is that kids, humans, naturally crave discipline and love it. I, I, that might sound weird to you, but it's a reality that I've experienced time and time again. We were created not to find truth for ourselves, not to raise ourselves. We were created to be a people shaped into the image of Christ. And we don't shape ourselves. And when we do, let me ask you a question. How's that been working for you? Not so good, huh? It's not unloving when I tell you you're wrong. It's unloving if I keep silent whenever there's consistent sin in your life and I never address it. God disciplines us because he loves us. And when we understand that God disciplines us because he loves us and sometimes he has tough love with us, when we really get it, I think we'll crave a relationship with him all the more. Listen to me, here's, here's something I wanted to share with you. His correction is not a contradiction of his consistent love. His correction of us is because of his great love for us. And it should be the same for us and others. Our love for others causes us to correct them. I mean, if you know somebody's going the wrong way, I remember we were in a, a, a line of, of cars. We were going from an a, amusement park with some friends, and my buddies were up front in uh, the car in front of me. And we needed to turn right, and he turned left. And I'm like, oh, no, that's not good. And he just kept on going. And so I called him up. I'm like, hey, Jason, yeah, you needed to turn right. But what if I didn't call him? What if I just left him there? Is that love? You know what I'm saying? Like, Because that's the same argument that's being used. If you love me, you'll just let me make any decision I want and go wherever I want and live my own life and just support me. I'm going to support you by picking up the phone and saying you made a wrong turn. And if you think I don't love you, then you're mistaken. So God does the same thing for us. Uh, I've told you this before, so we won't spend long on this, but it's like I've told you. Uh, I have a distinct memory of my dad whenever I was young. This is one of my, my favorite memories, and it's kind of weird that it is, but I've, I've grown to love it more and more. But whenever I was a kid, I'm in my Batman room, bent over my Batman comforter. My dad believed in something called spanking, and so I got myself a whipping, and, uh, and I was crying. I mean, it hurt, and so I turn around, and I'm just sobbing, and guess what I do? I fall into his arms. I can still tell you what flannel shirt he was wearing. And I can tell you that he smelled like his aftershave that he always did as I brushed up against his neck and held him as I cried. And he, his, his bristly beard was rubbing up against me. I mean, I vividly have this image of the one who disciplined me is the one I want to comfort me. Because I know that the one who's disciplining me is doing it out of love. Even when I didn't understand the phrase, son, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. 
I get it now. I get it now. And God is the same way. So he has tough love, but he also has, listen to me, tender love. And so it's not always tough love. And by the way, uh, let me just say, every bad thing you go through is not God disciplining you. Don't believe that. That's a lie. You, we live in a fallen and sin-filled world, and sometimes bad things just happen. But I promise you that no matter what pain you're experiencing, whether it is God intentionally disciplining you, or it's just pain you're experiencing from a fallen world or, a, 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 or, or the uh, Satan and his demons, whatever it is you're experiencing, God's going to use your pain to grow you. Tough love, but then there's tender love, and you got to have both. You see, God's love's not only tough, but a lot of times it's so tender. And God's tender love, I think, is most clearly seen in his embrace of his lost son, don't you? In Luke 15, you know, and you have this prodigal son who grabs all his money, says, Dad, his first statement out of his son's mouth in Scripture is, Father, give me. It's his first words. It's like my, my son right now. Mine. And that's what his son says, and he, he gets all his money, he runs off, and he lives crazy, he rebels on his family, he becomes dirt poor, he's desiring to eat food from the pig's, uh, uh, what do you call it, pig slop. And finally he says, I'm going to go back home, and maybe dad will make me a servant, like I know my dad. And when his dad sees him from far off, it's the only time in scripture you see God run. And it's because that's his boy. And my son's coming home. He might have had the tough love as you're walking out the door and saying, son, you're going the wrong direction. You can't do this. This is not the way I want you to live. This is not the way it should go. But he stays home. And when his son comes back, he expects dad to say, Psh, nah, I guess you can be one of my servants. No, no, no. His dad says, I'm sprinting. Can't you see it? Just full sprint to his son. And when he runs up, he doesn't even say a word. He just hugs him and kisses him. The tender love of God. What a beautiful picture. And that's what he does for us. Right? And, and we couldn't fully understand his tough love if you couldn't see his tender love. But they're both there. And that's why his love is perfect. He says, that's the kind of love you need to have for others. In John, you see the Son of God weep. One of the most short and powerful verses. No, the shortest and most powerful verse in Scripture, right? Jesus wept. It's that tender love. And Ephesians 4.32 says, For us to be kind and tender-hearted to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So you have this tough love, tender love. Number three is trustworthy love. This one's very important because this one, the first one that I said, tr tough love is the most misunderstood and leads people to rebel against Christ. Uh, trustworthy love is the one that we just fail to live out in our relationships, you know? This dependable love. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And then you have that scripture in Romans chapter 8 where he says, there's no height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation that can separate us from the love that's in Christ. His, his love is dependable. And that's because God made a choice that I'm going to love you no matter what. God has decided that no matter how we behave, his love will be unwavering for us. He will not tolerate our behavior. He will not tolerate our sins. He will tell us when we are wrong, but he will love us no matter what. You cannot outrun the love of God. And possibly better, you can't out -sin the love of God. Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. And if I rise on the wings of the dawn, and if I settle on the far side of the sea, I can't outrun your love. Because even there, your hand will guide me, and your right hand will hold me fast. You see, God's love for us is unconditional, and it's so consistent. He will never stop loving you because he loves you with a trustworthy love. And so if we're commanded to love like God loves us, why are the divorce rates rising so high? Why are the divorce rates rising so high in churches? Now, to be fair, the statistics on divorce are really hard to calculate. Whenever I was doing my research, I tried to kind of land somewhere in the middle personally. Uh, it's really tough to calculate, but especially now, because here's the deal. 
I can't count it as a divorce if you're just going to shack up and live with your girlfriend or boyfriend for five years. Like we got this weird concept in our, our modern day that I'll just live with you for five, six years and see how it's going and then decide because we don't understand commitment. We don't understand a choice. We don't understand trustworthiness and being dependable and being there. We don't understand that I'm going to choose to love you even when you make me mad. Right? Like, like that's the safe way to play this thing. And it dishonors God because did you know that marriage was meant to be a picture of God's relationship with his church? You look in scripture, there's so many metaphors of marriage depicting God's love for us and his commitment to us. And so with everyone who ends up going and moving in with their boyfriend or girlfriend, and for every divorce, we screw up the picture more and more. That picture becomes more and more distorted. But God's love for you, aren't you thankful that his love for you is not the same that we often give to others? And he says, I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, at our wedding ceremonies, we make vows, we share our vows with each other. And, and yeah, it's an emotional moment, you know. I mean, when Avery and I got married, you know, there's music and, and she's beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. I got a picture of my office if you want to see. Uh, she's just a stunner, okay? Have I said it enough? And, and so it, everything was just so perfect in the atmosphere, right? But when we said our vows to each other, I was telling Avery, and she was telling me, I choose you. For good, for bad, better or worse, till death do us part, right? Like, I'm with you. And there's nothing that's going to stand between that. But so often I hear other couples, and I, I know of one specifically right now, who, who when they get into an argument, divorce is thrown around almost as a, a threat. Let me tell you something. Divorce should never even be mentioned in your marriage. You should consider that the greatest cuss word in your marriage. Stop it. It's a choice that says, I'm going to stay with you. Now, abusive relationships are different. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But whenever your spouse makes you uncomfortable, it, it, look, when you, whenever you give this five-year test run, what you're saying is, I'm going to choose to love you as long as you look the way that I want you to look. I'm going to choose to love you as long as you make me feel good. I'm going to choose to love you as long as you bring something to the table that I like. But the moment that I get uncomfortable, I'm out. Kind of makes me think of uh, Sylvester Stallone and whenever he's doing the Rocky movies. And, uh, and he, said, he said after one of his fighting scenes, because he did his own stunts, you know. And so after one of the fighting scenes, he said, you know, boxing is pretty easy whenever I can stop it at any moment and yell, cut. He said, I could do this at that point. But a lot of times that's exactly how we view marriage. That's how we, not just marriage, but that's how we view our relationships with other people. I'm with you until you do this. And so we draw this imaginary line in the sand and we say, if you step over this line, I'm out. And some of you in this room have not been talking to people in your family because you drew a line and you said, they crossed the line. They hurt me too bad. They hurt my kids too bad. I will never speak to them again. Until they approach me and say the magic words, whatever those have been for you. Aren't you glad God didn't do that to you? You should be ashamed of yourself. Stop it. Because God says love is the mark that people will know you by. Again, I'm not talking about abuse here. That would be the one thing that has this exception. And I'm not saying that you have to bring somebody in to the same level that they may have been in. You know, I, I'm not going to let an alcoholic be a bartender. That doesn't make any sense. Right? There's still consequences. I'm not saying all that. I'm not trying to get all the way into your business. Just a little bit. Just enough to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable about this and make you rethink about the ones that you love the most. Because the relationships, listen to me, are the only thing you get to take with you after this life is over. So fight for them like they last, because they do. And, and it's going to be kind of weird whenever you get to heaven and that person comes walking up to you and they made it too, believe it or not, somehow. 
and you're going to say, I ain't talking to you. Like, when, when are you going to finally own up that, that I can still have some kind of a relationship with you and love you regardless of what you do? Let me, let me finish this sermon up. Mm, God's love is good, isn't it? And here's the best news of all. He has tough love, tender love, and trustworthy love. But he's also got triumphant love. It comes from a powerful scripture in 1 Corinthians 13. Love never fails. It's triumphant. Love is the very tool that he used to defeat Satan. You see, love never fails. People will fail. Possessions will fail. Pleasures will fail. Popularity will fail. But the love of God will never fail. God's love is triumphant love. And it's that kind of love that sent Jesus to leave equality with God and come down to this earth and be born in a manger. It's that love that caused him to spend 40 days in a wilderness being tempted by Satan. It's that kind of love that caused him to start a ministry he knew that would kill him in the end when he's only 33 years young. And it's that kind of love that pushed him to spend that awful evening in the garden. And it's that kind of love, it's that love that kept him on the cross. We sang the song, he could have called 10,000 angels to set him free from the cross. But love kept him up there. And folks, it's that same love that's going to bring him back for you again. And so the good news is this. God's love will, uh, will bring victory into your life. And what I love is it doesn't just forgive you of your past sins. It'll change you. It'll transform you. You ever seen Beauty and the Beast? I love that movie. I've seen it so many times. You know, I turn into a, no, oh, never mind. We're not going to talk about that. That's just embarrassing. I, I've watched it a lot of times, okay? Let's just suffice it to say. I like the movie. And uh, what I love about it, though, is you've got this beast who's just ugly and, and horrible, and, and he sounds bad. He's got this gruff voice, and he's just a, 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 a horrible person. He's a beast. And one person walks into his life and shows him love, and it doesn't just affect him. It transforms him. And Christ's love for you does the same thing. You see, his love for you doesn't just affect you. It will change you completely. And anybody in this room who's been changed by God's love, I'd like to hear you say amen. amen. God's love is powerful. It is good. It is tough love, tender love. It's triumphant love. And it's trustworthy love. God's love will never fail. And some of you need that this morning because other people have let you down or maybe you've been the one to let somebody else down, but you need to be reminded that through the love of God, you win. Folks, the lesson is yours. Think about it. If you need to respond, would you come as together we stand and sing?